We've been looking at the application of finite difference methods to parabolic partial differential equations. In the previous video, we looked at how to adapt implicit methods to equations that have nonlinear convective terms, such as the case in fluid mechanics and convective heat transfer. We looked at the first order implicit method and the Craig Nicholson method as applied to the unsteady one dimensional Burgers equation. Here we're going to look at the up and down differencing that we first introduced in the context of elliptic partial differential equations. Here we're going to apply it in the context of parabolic equations and we'll see how we can actually take advantage of the fact that we have both space and time in order to upgrade the up and down differencing to second order accurate. You remember in the elliptic case the sacrifice that we made in going with up and down differencing was that while it improved the diagonal dominance and therefore the iterative process to get the solution, the up and down differencing is only first order accurate if we want to keep it compact. So just i, i plus 1, and i minus 1. Here we're going to keep it compact, but we'll be able to take advantage of the time aspect as well in order to get a second order, or at least nearly second order scheme. So let me show you how that works. So we have our convective term. Let's just look at the u partial u partial x term. Remember, it's the 1D unsteady Burgers equation, so that's the only convection term we have. Up and down differencing says, if the flow is going in one particular direction or the other, we'll choose our finite differences in order to promote diagonal dominance of the resulting tridiagonal system of equations. So what that means for us is that when u is positive, and now in the Craig Nicholson, it's u at n plus a half midway between our two time steps, then we're going to take that partial u partial x term and approximate it as follows. The x marks the spot for Crank Nicholson is at the midway point between the two time steps n and n plus 1, so n plus a half if you will. And remember in order to get derivatives at this point we averaged across time levels. Now we're going to average across time levels in the same way as we did in the previous video, except that we're going to implement the up and down differencing in a very interesting and useful way. So at the previous time step, at the nth time step, we're going to actually approximate at the half interval between i and i plus 1 at the previous time n. So that's this location right here. So we use a central difference in x to get partial u partial x at that location. We'll do a similar thing here, except now we're going to use the half step to the left. So i minus a half, we use a second order accurate central difference in space for that one as well. And then when we take the averages of those two second order accurate central difference approximations across the time levels, we'll get an approximation right at the point that we want. And it'll turn out to be second order accurate. And it remains compact because it only involves i minus 1, i, and i plus 1. So here's how it looks. For that first derivative, now remember we have this u out front, but we'll leave that to the side for now. So we have partial u partial x. We're going to take the average of those two first derivatives at the nth time level, it'll be i plus a half, and at the n plus first time level, it'll be i minus a half. So we take the sum of those two, divide by two to take the average, to get the value right at the center at the x marks the spot. Then these are second order accurate central differences. So for i minus a half, that's ui n plus one, minus ui minus one n plus one. And for i plus a half, it'll be ui plus 1 minus ui, both at the nth time level. First root is so divided by delta x. Don't forget the 1 half out front. Now one thing you'll notice here is that even though this is ui minus ui minus 1, which looks like a backward difference, and ui plus 1 minus ui, which looks like a forward difference, these are actually both second order accurate central differences because they're at these midpoints as we just described. So that's what we do if u is positive. If u is negative, then we approximate that same partial u partial x derivative in the following way. We still want the approximation at the same location at the mid time level, halfway between n and n plus 1. But now we're going to use at the nth time level, i minus a half, and at n plus 1, n plus a half. So we're just flipping the averaging. So now I want to use the second order accurate central difference here to get the derivative at this location, and the second order accurate central difference here to get the derivative at this location, and then we average these two, we'll get an approximation at the center. Now remember, averaging across time levels is second order accurate in time, the same order of accuracy as our second order accurate central difference in time that we're using for the entire scheme in Craig Nicholson. But now at the nth time level, 
it's i minus a half, and at n plus 1, it's i plus a half. So now for this term, we have ui plus 1, n plus 1, minus ui, n plus 1. And then for this term, we have ui, n minus ui minus 1, n. Again, sum those up, take the average, and that gives us the value of partial u partial x at the location where we're approximating our partial differential equation. Okay, so let's put this all together. If you take these first derivative terms and incorporate them into the Craig Nicholson equation that we had from the previous video, and we're going to replace the central differences that we had there with the finite differences that we have here for the upward and downward differencing, then you get this mess right here. And it is a mess because you have these decisions. If u is positive, you use this. If u is negative, you use this. So you're going to have to have if-then statements in your code to accomplish that. But when you put all the unknowns on the left and put all the knowns on the right, as we normally do, this is just a tridiagonal problem. Three unknowns on the left and everything else on the right is known. So we have our one, two, three unknowns. We do have additional terms depending on whether u is positive or negative, positive or negative, but it's still just a tridiagonal system of equations. So we'll solve that tridiagonal system of equations for each time step. Now because of the nonlinearity, you'll remember that shows up in the c sub i. That's the current number, but the current number involves the velocity that u that's out front of the partial u partial x. So we don't know that yet. So we're going to have to iterate for each time step in order to get a converged solution for that time step before we move on to the next time step. Let me make several comments. So let's look at this third one first. So as I just mentioned, we're going to have to iterate at each time step in order to update the u out front of the partial u partial x because of the nonlinearity. That's typical of these implicit methods applied to nonlinear equations. We have to do this iteration. It was the same in the last video for the first order implicit and the Crank Nicholson method. Remember that for nonlinear equations, we often have to use under relaxation. We have an earlier video on successive over relaxation, S O R, and in the context of that, I talked about under relaxation, which is often necessary in order to have the iteration process converge at each time step. Now, this averaging across time levels that we just used keeps the system diagonally dominant. So the iterator process at each time step should converge, but we will have to check that if we change the equation. Now in terms of stability, Crank-Nicholson is unconditionally stable. Crank-Nicholson with up and down differencing remains unconditionally stable. So that's great. We do not have to worry about choosing the time step for numerical stability. We only have to worry about choosing the time step for numerical accuracy as we progress. Now, I'm not going to show it here, but if you look in the book, there is an additional part of this section that shows the accuracy, that analyzes the spatial accuracy of this scheme. And it turns out that whereas the up and down one differencing in the elliptic context was only first order accurate in space, it is essentially second order accurate in space in the context of these parabolic equations. And the reason is because the way we can do this averaging across time levels to maintain a compact as well as second order in space scheme. So this works really, really well. Now in the next video, we're going to look at multi-dimensional problems. So we've been looking at one-dimensional problems in x so far, so just x and t. Now we're going to look at two-dimensional, and of course three-dimensional would be a natural extension of that in the next video.